Good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here. It's an honor and pleasure to be here and speak to all of you. And I want to talk to you about using the James Mason model, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, in developing effective safety actions. That's my airplane, and it's a lovely airplane to fly, let me tell you. Let me tell you, ask you all a question. Yes, I'm a blind pilot. A man has a bad argument with his wife. He storms out of the house to the nearest bar and drinks four whiskeys. He then decides to go for a drink, for a drive. It's night time, there's a skim of snow on the ground and the tires of our victim's car are smooth. In rounding a poorly banked curve at excessive speed, the right front tire blows out, the car leaves the road, and is demolished. What's the cause of the accident? <laughs> I tell this story every time I teach an investigator's course, and every time everybody comes up with the same answer. <laughs> Aren't you glad your wives are out here, most of the gentlemen and the, and the poor ladies, our apologies to all of you who are wives. Okay, actually I asked the wrong question. Uh, it's not what is the cause of the accident, but what are the causes of the accident. And really all those items there are causes to this accident. Some of them refer to uh, items that have been in place for a long time, like for example, that poorly banked curve, is something that was there for a long time. Uh, something, some of those items are there uh, due to the conditions that were created by the person maintaining the car, i.e., the the rounded, uh, the, coup, the car, uh, car tires being smooth. Some of it were actions on that day. Uh, the individual drinking four whiskeys, going driving when he's obviously upset after an argument with his spouse, and then driving at an excessive speed. So there are many different things that led to this accident occurring, and each one of them are a cause to the accident. You take out one of those items, and quite possibly the accident would never have occurred. This is that famous uh, concept we all learned in early, the early days we come into this business, the concept of the error chain leading to an accident. So why do we investigate when we have events and accidents in our organizations? Well, uh, primarily there is a regulatory requirement and obligation to do so. There are legislations in place with regards to duty of care and looking after our employees, making sure we improve the systems so that our people are safe in the organization. It's a fundamental element of the SMS, identifying hazards that have uh, contributed to incidents and accidents and correcting them. By conducting an investigation, we identify deficiencies in the organization and we are able to put in preventive measures to make sure those events, don't, those, uh, constant, those factors don't co contribute to another accident down the road. And of course, safety is good for business. So safety investigation is good for business. In fact, I would say it is critical for business today. Businesses are becoming, uh, our profit margins are getting thinner all the time. And uh, evidence, there is evidence to show that organizations that do a better job of managing safety end up being more profitable. Here's a quote, a quote from the uh, IPO and Annual Digest. Nearly every accident contains evidence which, if correctly identified and assessed, will cause the circumstances and the causes to be ascertained so that corrective action can be undertaken to prevent further accidents. <clears throat> IKO Annex 13 is the primary guidance document provided to us by IKO with regards to the conduct of safety investigations in our organizations. And from that annex states, the sole objective of the investigation of an accident or incident shall be the prevention of accidents or incidents. It is not 
the purpose of the activity to apportion blame or liability. And I was very happy to hear my colleague from Kai Airways with his presentation on just culture. Now, need to make one point clear. Just culture is not no blame culture. There can, there can be events at times where we need to apportion blame. When you're dealing with individuals who have acted in an extremely reckless manner or have violated rules and procedures for personal gain, and this has led to an accident with either injury, death, or loss, these people need to be dealt with accordingly. And if you watch Captain Chichuk's presentation previously where he talked about his processes, there is there are events and times where people are properly held accountable. Not when you're doing a safety investigation. And next the thing says very clearly, it is not the purpose of this activity to apportion blame or liability. That is not saying that blame and liability should not be apportioned. It is just not acti that activity when you're conducting a safety investigation. And we adopted that as a very strong principle in my life when we conducted our internal safety investigation. So if ever I received a report that stated uh, the engineer failed to follow the procedure contained within a maintenance manual, I would reject that report. Because that statement is apportioning blame to an engineer, even though that's a statement of fact. Because during the safety investigation process, following the principles of NX 13, they are not supposed to apportion blame. Why? Can I ask anybody? Does anybody know why? Let's make this a bit interactive. Why is it not the purpose of this activity to apportion blame? Yes. Hampers the um, willingness to resource to be to do the investigation. Um, Good point. It could be another different uh, different avenue. Yeah. Correct. That's right. Anybody else? Okay, let me give you my take on this. <clears throat> you know, when you blame somebody for uh, and, and give them responsibility for an accident or an incident, it is emotionally satisfying. <laughs> him, that's the guy, he did it, bad boy, it's emotionally satisfying to blame someone, and once you've done that, you stop asking questions, you stop asking why, why did that event happen, and this is a problem, because as a safety investigator, you don't want to stop asking questions. You want to keep asking why and why and why until you find out all the causes to that particular incident or accident you're investigating. So we take that privilege away from the safety investigator. You will not apportion blame. Now you're dissatisfied because you've not been able to point and blame. You keep asking why and why and why and you take <coughs> all the causes to your particular event so that you derive all the required safety enhancements to prevent that event from happening. That's why that principle is there. Let me tell you another story before we move on with the slides. About seven, years, seven eight years ago, a gentleman by the name of George Snyder, he's a long-serving member of one of the boards at the Flight Safety Foundation. He came over to my airline to do some work and he was reading some of my investigation reports. And he called me into the office one day for everything and said, you know, Adrian, I think you're missing the point. I think you're not getting down to all the causes of your events. Not enough root cause analysis. Okay, George. So I went out and uh, had a think. Went on the internet, searched and searched and searched. You know what? There's not a lot of guidance out there on how to do root cause analysis in our industry. Not a lot, there's some, but not a lot. I finally found a document through uh, the Euro Control website, now it's known as Kyberry, uh, on a process they developed called SOM, 
systemic occurrence analysis method. It was good. It developed by a couple of guys in Australia, so I contacted them, and they were quite happy to be met here in Singapore, and uh, they came up and helped develop a process that we use now in Malaysia Airlines uh, in all our safety investigations, and this is what I'm sharing with you this evening, this, this morning. <clears throat> we call the process market. Malaysia Airlines root cause analysis technique. It's based on James Reason's Swiss cheese model, and all of you have heard of James Reason's Swiss cheese model, I'm sure, where we use the model to identify organizational and system factors, the contextual conditions that our people are operating in at the time, the actions of our people, or the inaction of our people, any failed or absent barriers involved in that particular event that led to that particular occurrence. Here are some of the uh, principles that existed and both led to the development of market. Of course, there's a James Reason model himself, developed by Professor James Reason. There's Tripod Delta, developed by Shell Petroleum in 1994. ICAM, developed in the resource industry by BHP Billiton. And then finally, Soyam itself, that was developed for Euro Control for use among their ATM providers. This is James Reason's Swiss Norm Model. James calls these things uh, latent conditions, active failures, or limited windows of opportunity. And being developed by the, by the gentleman in Australia with us, uh, we renamed some of these items as organizational system failures, organizational and system factors, contextual conditions, human involvement, and absent or failed barriers. We identify these elements in our events Describe how a hazard traveled through these events and led to the occurrence we are investigating. Elements of an organizational occurrence include things like latent conditions, like that poorly banked curve with our friend in the car. These are organizational factors which produce or allow the conditions or local factors for occurrence. Active failures, errors or violations which have immediate adverse effect. And most of the time, when you investigate your events, there will definitely be elements of active failures and uh, violations. Inadequate or absent barriers and defenses, these are uh, fa fa failures of, of barriers we have in place, or barriers that are completely missing, that prevented a hazard from leading to the occurrence we are investigating. Elements of market based on James Reason, absent and failed barriers, these are last minute measures that fail to protect against the hazards of human errors, human involvement, again, contextual conditions, and organizational and system factors. Contextual conditions is something that requires a little bit more explanation. These are conditions that are in place that um, contribute, that are created because of an organizational factor, and that contribute and explain why a particular person acted in a particular way that led to an accident. Like, for example, do you see this wire on the ground that's attached to this monitor up in front for me to see my slides? Can you see how it's taped down? Have you ever been to an organization or to a classroom where you see wires lying across the ground? That's a hazard, a condition that's sitting in place. And if that wire had not been taped down here, they obviously have a good safety manager at this facility. See how he has taped down the wire. So if that wire was not taped down and I'm walking across and I trip over it, that's my action. And the condition is that wire was sitting there and nobody has seen the wire until I actually trip over it, leading to an accident of me probably hurting myself as I fall to the ground. Bring to your attention this accident. Uh, a maintenance-related accident. All of you may be very familiar with it. British Airways Back 111 event uh, back in 1990. In front of you, you should see this chart placed on your table. In this particular event, an engineer had replaced the windshield of this airplane the night before this airplane went flying. Uh, he had mistakenly used the wrong bolts to secure the windshield in place. And the airplane took off, and when it achieved a particular level of uh, 
pressurization within the cabin. The windshield gave way. The captain was sucked out. Thankfully, his foot was caught on a seat belt. A cabin attendant came into the airplane and hung on to the captain while the co-pilot brought the airplane down safely landed. Thankfully, the captain was injured, but he survived quite miraculously. And I'm sure some of you have read this investigation report. The report is available on the internet, written by the, most likely you can go to the AAIB website and you can get a copy of this investigation. That's the Accident Investigation Board of the United Kingdom. So what we've done is, just as an example, we've taken the AAIB report and constructed a market chart. That's the chart you have in front of you. As an example of this particular event. There's a picture of the uh, of the wrong bolts that was used. You can see the bolt in the middle is quite a bit smaller than the bolt on the right hand side. The supervisor was doing the job unaided the night before the flight. Uh, he did not consult the maintenance manual or the illustrated parts catalog. He selected the wrong bolts by feel alone. And he did not notice the bolt head countersink discrepancies. You can see it's quite clear that the bolt in the middle is not in place properly. Here are some organizational issues identified, mm -hmm. identified by the ADID. It was night shift. There was high workload at the time. They were understaffed on that shift. A proper stand was not available for the change of the windshield. The torque wrench was not available, and instead, I believe the engineer used a torque limiting screwdriver. Inadequate labeling of parts, poor lighting at the time, the engineer was guessing which bolts to use in semi lighted conditions. There was no dual inspection required or carried out in the procedure at that time. And there was also no required to do a pressurization check after the window change. I believe there have been some changes to procedures to this event. So here's this market chart, we take a look at it. On the left, all the organizational factors identified in the AIB report are listed. And then they are linked to the conditions that those organizational factors create. In those conditions, our humans act, and it explains the actions that they carry out. We identify failed or absent barriers that may have prevented a hazard coming through leading to the event on the right hand side and we chart these things across. Once we chart these things across, we then derive recommendations based on all the boxes in green. Only those are organizational factors and the absent or failed barriers. We don't derive any recommendations on the human involvement. Because remember, complying with the principles of X13, you are not to apportion blame. So you do that by not addressing the actions of the individual. You address the organizational factors and the failed or absent barriers alone. Let's look at one, for example. Workforce management, the first one on top left-hand corner, cost-cutting practices led to staff shortage on night shift. This led to the conditions of high workload due to reduct reduction in staff members, night shift with heavy workload, so supervisor decides to help out. The supervisor decided to do the job unaided by himself, there was, at the time, no requirement to consult the manual or illustrated parts catalog, so that was not done. There would have been a barrier that may have prevented this event from happening. And because this was not in place, the organizational factor led to the uh, contributing to the event. And if you look at all those factors and conditional conditions, this charts out all the findings of the AAIB report. And this is what we do in Malaysia Airlines. We, we, especially for the high-risk high events, we make our investigators put all their findings and all their, all their conclusions into a chart to explain how their findings are contributory or causal to the incident or accident they are investigating at the time. The advantage we found afterwards is when you have a chart like this, and you go up to a department and say, I need you to carry out this recommendation as a safety enhancement practice, and this is why we are doing it. You get more buy-in. Rather than just making a recommendation and not explaining to people why such a recommendation exists, when you give them a chart and show them the con how it has contributed or caused the accident being investigated, you get more buy-in from people to carry out their actions. That is really advantage for us. 
So flight safety is our aim. Investigation is necessary. But by nature, it is reactive. You are investigating a failure. So, the further development from developing market in the organization, we wanted to be, make it a more proactive process to prevent incidents and accidents that have not yet occurred. So, along with those two gentlemen in Australia, we further developed market into something we call pilot, <laughs> which stands for proactive integrated risk assessment. And you utilize the same principles based on the James Reason Swiss cheese model, we identify the hazards and put in uh, recommendations based on a hypothetical event before it has even occurred as a safety enhancement process, as a risk management process. There is a paper on pilot available on the internet. I have a few copies with me here, so if you want a copy, come and see me after, after this session, and I'm quite happy to give you a copy. I have, I have about 20 copies of the, the paper here, but it's also available on the internet. If you do a search on it, and this paper describes the entire process in detail. Briefly, what this process is, we begin by describing an accident scenario, entirely hypothetical. Remember, this is entirely proactive. We've not had an incident or an accident, but we're thinking, asking ourselves, what would happen if this happened to us? If this happened to us, what is it in our organization that led to this accident happening? We provide a brief description of this hypothetical event covering what happened, when did it happen, where did it happen, who did it happen to, and what are the potential losses and cost to the organization. We ask ourselves, what are the failed barriers or absent barriers we have in our organization that could have prevented, that can prevent a hypothetical event like this happening to us? Describe the last minute measures which failed or were missing and therefore not, not there to prevent the accident. We have a check question. Does the item describe a work procedure, aspect of human awareness, physical obstacle, warning or control system, or protection measure designed to prevent an occurrence or lessen its consequence? And if it passes that question, we've identified a failed or absent barrier. We look at human involvement, we describe the errors or violations that our people might commit, actions or emissions, and the scene at which triggered the accident. It must be there and it must have triggered the event that we hypothetically investigate. We have a check question, does the item describe an error and or violation that immediately contributed to the occurrence? And if it does, we find any threat, a good human involvement. Same with contextual condition. <laughs> Describe the context of the event, the conditions existing immediately prior to and or at the time of the accident. And the check question is, does the item describe an aspect of the workplace, local organizational climate, task demands, or person's attitudes, personality, performance, limitations, physiological or emotional state that helps explain their actions? Organizational factors, describe the organization and system factors that created or allowed the prevailing contextual conditions. So in this organization here at the Singapore Aviation Academy, the organizational factor is we have a good safety officer who took the trouble to take down that cable. And he did so as a safety consideration for our protection here. So if anybody walks across, he doesn't trip over and fall to the ground. So the organizational factor here is you have an obviously good safety manager. I hope we meet him sometime today. We have a check question. Does the item describe an aspect of an organization's culture, systems, processes, or decision making that existed before the occurrence and which resulted in the relevant contextual conditions or allowed these conditions to continue? The organizational and system factors which created or allowed the prevailing contextual conditions. This could be things like training, workforce management, accountability, communication, organizational culture, competing goals, policies and procedures, maintenance management, equipment infrastructure, risk management, change management, external environment. These are all 
the categories of organizational factors then can, that can create contextual conditions, dangerous contextual conditions, they can lead to incidents and accidents in our organizations. Finally, step number six is we provide recommendations that will prevent this scenario from happening either again or happening in future in our organizations. We make recommendations specifically for the absence of field barriers and the organizational factors alone. Here's an example of a pilot we created. My, my airline has a turboprop operation on the uh, western <coughs> side of uh, Kalimantan Island, the states of Sabah and Sarawak in Malaysia. We fly two dollars there, and we want to ask ourselves, what are the possibilities of, of an airplane having an engine failure, climbing out of a mountainous area, and having an accident over there? And what are we doing to manage the risk of that happening to us? So we created this market, identified possible organizational factors, and failed or absent barriers, and we went in there and put recommendations in place for an event that had not occurred as a proactive measure to prevent this type of accident occurring. Again, create the recommendations for all those boxes. Here's another one. It was a media collision scenario that we considered might occur because at the time, a number of uh, flying schools had suddenly opened up, and there were a lot of flying school airplanes around the place. Some of these airplanes were not TCAS, were not transponder equipped, so we were a bit concerned about the possibility of a, of a, a mid air collision. So we did this analysis to identify what are the organizational factors or fail absent barriers that could lead to this accident happening and put the recommendations in place to manage the risk to an acceptable level. Finally, one more important point is this. When you're looking at the actions of your individual, it's very easy to take an outside or hindsight view. And most of the times we do that. When we read about terrible accidents in the papers, about the actions of other individuals, we form an opinion in the back of our minds of what might have happened, but that's usually a hindsight or an outside view. This is not acceptable for the safety investigator. The safety investigator needs to put himself in the condition, in the situation, at the time of the event, to understand why that person's actions were thus appeared to be a logical thing for him to do, and it may have led to this incident or accident. Take the inside view. Remember also, errors do not cause accidents. Airbus and LOSA estimate that in aviation we have one accident for every 10 million errors. Why? Because most crew members deal with errors quite well. Unexpected events, they manage their own errors, they manage their own violations, make good decisions, show good judgment. They recognize potentially dangerous actions and situations knowing the limits. In fact, I put it to you, when I'm doing my investigation, I find a lot of our people who are working on the floor, in the cabins of our airplanes, in the cockpits, are actually on a daily basis achieving heroic actions to keep the, our organization safe. Remember that when you're investigating your people. Errors help safety. They identify risky activities and teach us to be careful. But you need to get your people to tell you about their errors to report their errors to you, so that you're able to identify the problem. And you do that, as you quite correctly mentioned, by making sure you create a just culture in your organization. So people are willing to report their errors to you, and you're able to do something about it before they lead to a real accident. <coughs> we'll take questions and comments at the end, I believe. Thank you very much, have a good day. Oh, one, more, uh, one more point. Uh, this is uh, Aerosafety World, the latest edition of Aerosafety World. There's a couple of really interesting uh, articles in this particular issue that you might be interested in. One is on just culture, which we talked about this morning. And another one is on detecting uh, fatigue cracking on maintenance structures. Get a copy, I believe some are available outside. And while you're there, join the foundation. <laughs>